Welcome back to Movies Outpost. Today we'll be diving into an action thriller movie titled, Snitch. Enjoy the recap. Our story revolves around a typical 18-year-old lad, Jason who's just hanging out, video chatting with his buddy, the guy who hooks him up with some less than legal substances. His buddy pops the question, can you take the delivery at your place? Jason with his teen nonchalance, gives a nod of approval. Cut to his dad, John Matthews, a hardworking construction company owner. After a long day's grind, he spots Daniel, one of his workers, heaving sacks of cement into a vehicle. Something stirs in him, he rolls up his sleeves and joins in, assisting Daniel with the load, a gesture that earns him gratitude. Meanwhile, a courier arrives at Jason's doorstep. He rips it open to find a stash of drugs and a camera. The sight of the camera makes him realize he's walked straight into a police trap. Panicked, Jason makes a mad dash but the cops are hot on his heels and eventually they nab him. At this time John is off, enjoying a social gathering when his phone buzzes. It's Sylvie Collins, his ex-wife, with news that sends shockwaves through him. Their son Jason has been nabbed for drug trafficking. John races to the police station, meets his ex and then his lawyer, Jay Price. Jay breaks it down for them. Jason was no dealer, he was set up by his so-called buddy in a sting operation to lighten his own punishment. The charges against Jason, they could land him in prison for at least a decade. The only way out, convince Jason to play bait and help catch bigger fish in the drug-dealing pond. Feeling a wave of guilt and fear for his son's life, John is desperate. He tries to explain to Jay, his lawyer, that Jason is just an average kid who fell in with the wrong crowd. But Jay reminds him of the harsh reality. Jason was caught red-handed with a serious load of narcotics, and his best shot at a reduced sentence is to help the police net more dealers. As the wheels of justice move quickly, Jason is brought before the court. The judge pushes his trial date forward but orders him to jail until then. John, Sylvie and Jay meet with Jason, laying out his options. They try to convince him to cooperate, to help take down more drug dealers to lessen his time behind bars. But Jason maintains he's clueless about any major players in the drug world. He only knows small-time jokers doing it for kicks, and if he rats them out, he's essentially wrecking their lives just like his own. He leaves the room, leaving John more worried than ever, the stress gnawing at him day by day. Pulling some strings, John manages to set up a series of meetings with Joanne Keegan, the local U.S. attorney, who's deep in an aggressive anti-drug campaign to boost her congressional election bid. He lays it all out, giving her a detailed account of his son's predicament. Despite John's heartfelt plea, Joanne flatly turns him down. Jason was nabbed with a hefty stash, she argues. The dejected John leaves her office and makes his way to the prison to visit Jason. What he sees sends a shiver down his spine. Jason's face marred with cuts and bruises from a prison beatdown, and his overall physical condition declining. Jason chokes up as he reminisces about his childhood spent with his dad, tears welling up as he confesses he doesn't think he can endure ten years in such a brutal environment with beatings seemingly unavoidable. The sight of his son in such a state shatters John. Haunted by the visit, John takes a detour into the city's underbelly, where drugs change hands in shadowy corners. He concocts a daring plan to nab some dealers himself and hand them over to the cops. But his intentions are readable from a mile away, and his plan backfires as the dealers deliver a thorough beating. Just in the nick of time, the police swoop in to rescue him. When Joanne Keegan hears about John's reckless mission, she confronts him, spelling it out that even if he'd managed to capture someone, it wouldn't have affected Jason's case. In desperation, John asks if there's any way to lighten his son's sentence. Joanne, finally revealing a glimmer of hope, tells him there is one possible route to save his son. Joanne lays down the gauntlet. John needs to collar a high-profile dealer, one with at least a kilo of the hard stuff. Only then can they consider easing up on Jason. It's a tall order, catching a big-time narcotics kingpin isn't exactly a walk in the park. But John's determined, he assures her that some of his construction crew, a motley of ex-cons and recovered addicts, might have leads that could help. Reluctantly, Joanne agrees to lessen Jason's sentence if John manages to bring in a dealer. She's clear though, she won't be offering much help, and the risk lies squarely on his shoulders. Digging through his employee records, John comes across Daniel James. Daniel's been down the drug road before, racking up two distribution charges. But now, with a wife and a young son to look after, he's trying to keep his nose clean and avoid that third strike. John finds Daniel as he's wrapping up work for the day, and offers him a ride home. They detour to a cafe, where over a cup of joe, John broaches the topic. He spins a tale about wanting to dip his toes into the drug trade, hoping that Daniel could give him an introduction to a major dealer, a way for him to infiltrate their ranks. Daniel's taken aback by John's proposition, expecting him to be nothing but an honest, hard-working guy. He insists he's done with the drug world, trying his best to scrub every trace of it from his life. He's been in prison twice already and is craving a clean slate. He can't help John. John ups the ante, offering Daniel $5,000 for an introduction to a heavy hitter in the drug scene. Daniel sticks to his guns, not willing to risk a third prison tour. 
John ups his offer to a whopping $20,000, assuring him it's just for an introduction. Initially, Daniel walks away but later, thinking about a safer home for his son, he relents. Unbeknownst to him, he's aiding an informant. Daniel bridges the gap between John and Malik, a formidable local drug lord who, like Daniel, is two strikes in. John lays out his case. His business is barely treading water in the current economy and he's open to smuggling a near-endless stream of drugs. His fleet of freight trucks, part of a legitimate business, would escape suspicion and carry too much cargo to be searched extensively. Malik agrees, but with one stipulation, for the inaugural run, John and Daniel have to be behind the wheel. Getting ready for the operation, John and Agent Cooper set up a network of wiretaps, intending to snag every bit of the illicit deals that go down. Together with Daniel, John hits the road, destination El Paso, a stone's throw away from the border, their rendezvous point, a nondescript junkyard. As they meet the drug dealers, they're quizzed on their smuggling tactics. John reveals his plan, to hide the drugs in sacks of cement. As they get to work, the tranquil junkyard quickly devolves into a battleground. They've been ambushed by the rival gang, Baja Norte. With bullets flying, John and Daniel scramble for cover. Spotting a potential escape route, they jump back into their truck. As the rival gangs remain locked in their fierce shootout, John puts pedal to the metal, gutting it out of there. They smash through piles of scrap, shatter the front gate, and ram into several parked cars, one of them harboring an undercover cop. Against all odds, John and Daniel make a daring escape, their truck loaded with contraband. Bird travels up the cartel hierarchy, reaching the ears of the big shot, Juan Carlos Pintera. Impressed with John's nerve and the audacious escape, he commends his actions to Malik. Respect for John rises within the cartel ranks. With the mission completed and the contraband safely in their possession, John and Daniel retreat back to John's factory late in the night. They switch vehicles under the cloak of darkness, hoping to shake off any potential tales. John tells Daniel he's stepping away for a moment to relieve himself, but Daniel spots him in the office, hunched over a phone. Suspicion immediately clouds Daniel's mind. Confronting John, Daniel pulls out a gun, accusing him of betrayal. He frisks John for a wire, his mind whirling with paranoia. John pleads his innocence, assuring Daniel he was merely calling his wife. Still skeptical but with no evidence of deception, Daniel lets John go. They get back on the road, Agent Cooper tailing them at a safe distance, his eyes glued to their every move. Arriving at their destination, John delivers the drugs to Malik, all under the keen surveillance of Agent Cooper. Malik, in passing, mentions an upcoming meeting with some influential figures in the cartel, an opportunity for a bigger catch. Seizing the potential, Cooper refrains from apprehending Malik then and there, letting the deal slide under the radar. The following day, an infuriated John confronts Joanne Keegan, reminding her of their agreement. Cooper steps in, playing the mediator, suggesting that the failed arrest might serve a bigger purpose, nabbing the more prominent figures in the cartel. Later, at work, John decides to pay a visit to his son Jason, unaware that Daniel is quietly trailing him. He sees Sylvie, his ex-wife, waiting anxiously in the visitor's room. She tells him that Jason is in the infirmary with 36 stitches and that they won't be able to see him for at least two days. Leaving the prison, John is met by an irate Daniel who demands to know who he was visiting. Cornered, John divulges the truth to Daniel. The revelation sparks a volatile rage in Daniel. He warns John of the severe repercussions. The merciless cartel would annihilate them and their families without a second thought if they discovered the ruse. As John gets back home, he is met with an alarming sight. His wife tear stricken and Malik casually sitting outside by the pool. Malik has news the cartel wants a meeting. The moment they arrive at the appointed place, Malik is asked to wait outside. Alone and tense, John steps into the meeting under the watchful eyes of the cartel's intimidating security. John finds himself opposite Juan Carlos Pintera, the room charged with an undercurrent of danger. Pintera, in a chillingly calm manner, lays down a monumental task before John, to transport nearly $100 million of the cartel's drug earnings back to Mexico, across the border. Equipped with this newfound intelligence, John rushes to convey the plan to Keegan and Cooper. Keegan's excitement is palpable, as she envisions the downfall of the entire cartel with Pintera's arrest. But Cooper, always the cautious one, expresses his concern for John's safety, suspecting the cartel's plan to eliminate John once he has served his purpose. Unyielding, John asserts his condition, Jason's immediate release upon the task's completion. Keegan, though initially hesitant, agrees to his terms. John, with his course charted, pays a visit to Daniel's home laying out the full extent of their precarious situation. Together, they devise a daring plan that would liberate them both from the ruthless cartel and the relentless government. As John embarks on the mission, he pulls off a clever move switching trucks managing to elude Cooper's surveillance on the original truck. 
John arrives at the pickup point for the cash he loads up and makes tracks followed by a cartel escort. Daniel takes on a risky task of his own. He storms Malik's residence, confronting Malik's guards and overpowering them. In the resulting confrontation, Malik is critically wounded. With death looming, Malik hands Daniel a potentially game-changing piece of information, Pintera's personal cell phone number. Their fates now hinged on a single call. Pulling out Pintera's number, John places a call to Cooper. He asks Cooper to trace his new cell phone and Pintera's number, essentially serving both the massive drug haul and the kingpin on a silver platter. The cartel soon uncovers John's secretly incarcerated son Jason and that he's an informant. High stakes chase on the highway erupts into a frenzied chaos. Bulls whiz past John's truck as he clutches his shotgun, firing back at his pursuers. In the intense crossfire, a bullet lodges into his leg, but he fights against the surge of pain. Suddenly, he spots another assailant's vehicle. Swerving his truck, he shoots into it, sending it tumbling off the highway. At the same time, Cooper's pursuit of Pintera is closing in. The DEA raids Pintera's residence, but they find it deserted. Pintera has already made his getaway. A brief glance at a passing car catches Cooper's attention. It's Pintera, trying to slip away unnoticed. Cooper and his team move quickly, blocking and surrounding Pintera's car. The Kingpin realizes the futility of resisting, especially with his young son beside him, and surrenders. Back on the highway, the cartel members are still hot on John's tail. They manage to shoot out his tires, but John clings on, refusing to slow down. Another attacker tries to take him out, but John retaliates, slamming his truck into the attacker's car and causing a massive explosion. The loss of his tires finally catches up to him, causing him to lose control and roll his truck. Trapped and disoriented, he sees a figure rushing towards him. Fearing the worst, he attempts to reload his gun, but his fear turns into relief as he recognizes the figure. It's an agent from the DEA, coming to his aid. The dawn of the next day brings a wave of relief. Jason is released from prison, and John's family is quickly taken taken into the witness protection program. Daniel, however, opts for a different path. He declines the offer for witness protection, choosing instead to take his family into hiding on their own terms. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next one.